many of you are familiar with my work, um, but I write a lot about immigration, uh, especially from a child's perspective, because I experienced immigration as a child, and that's what I tend to write about, immigration from a child's point of view. I also write a lot about family separation and the long-term effects that separation has on families. I write a lot about border crossings, real and metaphorical. And in my new book, A Dream Called Home, I write about my search for a place to belong, a place to call home, but it's also about my experiences as a Mexican immigrant and a first-generation college student. But more than that, it's also about my journey as a writer, my literary metamorphosis. So today, I'm going to be talking about my immigration and my transformation. And um, I will talk about my relationship with writing and how it has changed through the years, how I've learned to use it to transform myself and also my community. So a question I get asked a lot is, um, well, I get asked two questions. One is, are you related to Ariana Grande? No, the answer is no. <laughs> I wish, I wish I was. I wish she was my cousin, but she's Italian, by the way, not Mexican. Uh, well, the other question I get asked is, um, why do you write? Why do you write? I think uh, most writers get asked that question. Why do you write? For me, this question has a different answer because the reason why I write has depended a lot on where I find myself in life. So using the butterfly metaphor, I believe that as a writer, I have also had very distinct stages and my relationship with writing has, has changed depending on which stage I am in. So one of the authors I admire, James Baldwin said, you write in order to change the world. If you alter even by a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. I really love his way of looking at writing and why we write. But when I started to write as a 13-year-old girl, I did not have heroic ambitions or lofty dreams for my writing. My writing was not an act of activism. My writing was not an act of protest or a demand for social justice or social change. My writing was not meant as political awareness or political engagement. I was not writing to raise my voice to, be, to speak up for my immigrant community. I was not writing to change other people's perception of the world. I wasn't using language to fight for human rights. Now, I do write for all of those reasons and more. But back then when I was a young girl in my caterpillar stage, writing for me was simply this. It was an act of survival and nothing more. I wasn't trying to save the world. I was trying to save myself. When I first put pen to paper at 13, I was a teenage girl suffering from extreme trauma caused by my immigrant experiences. I was suffering from the trauma of poverty. I was born in a shack made of sticks and cardboard in the state of Guerrero, which is the second poorest state in Mexico where 70% of the population lives in poverty. Even today, my family who still lives there is getting by with a measly $5 a day in wages. So because of this poverty, I experienced family separation. I was two years old when my father left Tijuana and came here to the United States to look for work. I was four and a half years old when my mother also left to come here to look for work. So by the time I was five, I no longer had a mother or a father. And the border had come between us. And my siblings and I were left behind to grow up in fear. The fear of being forgotten, the fear of being abandoned, and the fear of being replaced by US-born siblings. 
we spend our childhoods longing for a family. And that was the only dream that we had, and that was the only dream that sustained us during the years that my parents were gone. As a teenage girl, I was also dealing with the trauma of being a border crosser. When I was nine and a half, my father returned to Mexico, and he brought us to the border, hired a smuggler, and we attempted to get across. It took two attempts, and we got caught. And then before we tried our third attempt, my father said that was it, that if we didn't make it the third time, he was going to send us back to Mexico, and he was going to cross by himself, because otherwise he was going to lose his job in the US. So the third time, we ran as fast as we could, because we didn't want to get sent back. And luckily, we managed to evade the ever-watching eyes of Border Patrol, and we made it across. And we began our new lives in the United States. As a teenage girl, I was also dealing with the trauma of discrimination and marginalization. When I first arrived in the US and I was put in school, my school didn't have any resources for immigrant children like me. They didn't, it didn't have bilingual education. It didn't have uh, English as a second language classes. So when I entered my classroom and my fifth grade teacher saw that I didn't speak any English, she pointed to the farthest corner of her classroom and sent me there and built an invisible wall between us. And I sat there in that corner on the other side of that wall feeling inadequate, feeling that there was something wrong with me, that I wasn't enough. As a teenage girl, I was also dealing with the trauma of deportation because I was afraid that at any given moment, my family could be separated once again. My other trauma I was dealing with was learning to speak English. Because as you know, when immigrants come to this country, we are told over and over and over again that in this country we speak English only. And if you don't learn the language, then you are risking being marginalized and being treated like a second class citizen for the rest of your life. And because my school did not have um, the right programs for immigrant children, I experienced something called subtractive bilingualism, which is the act of replacing your mother tongue and substituting English. Through my school years, I was never encouraged to be bilingual. I was never encouraged to be biliterate. The only purpose of my classes was to make me English dominant as quickly as possible at the expense of my Spanish. And I was made to feel so ashamed about being a Spanish speaker that I began to reject my mother tongue. And that has had um, long-term consequences that I'm still dealing with even now. And I actually just finished writing a piece that's gonna be published by CNN sometime this week about my trauma of learning English and having to lose my mother tongue and how it has affected me in many different areas of my life. So all in all, as a teenage girl, I was just dealing with the trauma of becoming an American, the trauma of assimilation and acculturation. So when I started to write at 13, I was desperate to find a way to deal with the turmoil I felt inside. I was trying to find meaning in the uncharted chaos that was my life. And through my young adulthood, I knew there was something wrong with me. I just didn't know what it was. And last summer, during Trump's zero tolerance policy, one of the interesting things that were coming out of it were numerous articles talking about trauma. And I was fascinated reading these articles, reading about migrant children and the psychological trauma that they suffer. And these articles, as I read them, gave me an insight into what happened to me. Perhaps not at the scale that these children 
are dealing with because my experiences was nowhere near as horrifying as their experiences. But it gave me the words, the language, to be able to name what I felt inside all of those years ago as a young girl. And I learned words such as um, toxic stress. And I learned words, trauma and PTSD and anxiety and depression. And this particular piece talked about how children separated from their parents early in life and raised without a constant loving caregiver suffer a profound impact on cognitive ability, social function, mental health, and brain development. And I thought about all those years that I was separated from my parents, living with my evil grandmother, and dealing with this, and I had no idea that those experiences were affecting the architecture of my brain and how they were impacting my mental health and my brain development and my social functions. I had no idea. But when I was writing about all of my feelings, all of these emotions, I knew that that was the only way I was gonna, ha I was gonna heal from everything that had happened to me. So this was a very illuminating thing for me, reading about immigrant trauma and finally having the words. Because as a young girl, I learned to express my feelings through stories. So I entered my next stage, which is the pupa stage. And this was the stage when I was writing to learn how to be a storyteller. When I graduated from high school, I went to my local community college, Pasadena City College, and I had the very good fortune of meeting my English professor, Diana Savas. And she was the first professor who ever said to me, Reina, you have talent as a writer. Have you ever considered pursuing a career as a writer? And my answer was, no. Do Latinos even write books? As a young girl, I had been an avid reader. But perhaps I was reading the wrong books. <laughs> I was reading uh, Sweet Valley High and Flowers in the Attic and The Babysitter's Club. As I got older, I was reading um, young adult literature, like I Know What You Did Last Summer. I discovered Stephen King, and I read everything he wrote. And then I discovered the romance novel section in my library, and I was sneaking romance novels and then reading them under the cover at night so that nobody would see what I was reading. So there were no Latinos in these books, by the way. <laughs> and I would read these books fascinated because they gave me access to an America that wasn't mine. But I always felt like an outsider every time I read them. And I always felt like someone on the outside looking into someone else's life. So I, I had never read Latino literatures. I didn't know Latinos wrote books. So then my professor began to remedy that situation and she gave me The Moths and Other Stories by Elena Maria Viramontes. She gave me The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. She gave me The Stories of Eva Luna by Isabel Allende. She gave me How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accent by Julia Alvarez, and many, many other books written by Latina writers, which was very, very powerful for me. And I finally could see myself in books. I no longer felt like an outsider. When I read these books, I felt like I was a family member being invited over for dinner. And it was beautiful to feel connected to literature. And these books gave me something magical. They gave me the possibility of hope, of hope that maybe one day I could be a published author just like them. And the author who most resonated with me was, of course, Sandra Cisneros, because unknowingly, I was following her writing philosophy. And she says, 
Don't write about the things that you remember. Write about the things you wish you could forget. And I had been doing that for many years, writing about the things I wish I could forget. So thanks to these books and my professor, I became the first person in my family to sit foot in a university. And I went there to learn how to be a writer. And the university was my cocoon. It was there where I learned all about craft, where I acquired the tools and the, and the techniques of storytelling, and where I learned to nurture my artist self. It was there where I learned that there's a difference between being lonely and being alone. And I learned to embrace my solitude and to turn inward to find the story. I also learned to face my fears, to be brave and to follow the story wherever it needed to go, even if it meant picking up my wounds and bleeding all over again. And it was here at the university where I began to write a novel where I was exploring my deepest fear. What would have happened to me if my father had never returned? What would have been on my life? So I wrote an entire novel exploring this unanswered question, this fear of mine that even to this day, I still ask myself, what would have happened to me if my father had never returned to Mexico and brought me here to give me a chance? So three years later, I graduated from the university and became the first person in my family to obtain a diploma, a university diploma. And by doing so, I entered my next stage, which was the emerging stage. This is when I was writing to make a career out of a dream. So after UCSC, I spent four years trying to figure out how to make my dream a reality. And unfortunately, I discovered that my program had not fully prepared me for the realities of the publishing world. We had talked a lot about craft. We talked a lot about plot and character development and structure and dialogue and setting. I knew how to write a book but I didn't know how to sell it. So after graduation, I had absolutely no idea how to find an agent or approach a publisher. I didn't even know what a query letter was. And in my ignorance, I would go out and buy newspapers and look in the classified section, thinking that maybe an agent or an editor might have put an ad there that they were looking for a novelist to write a novel and they would hire me. But surprise, surprise, they don't put ads in the paper. <laughs> so it took me four difficult years to figure out how I was going to become a published writer. And I was very fortunate that in Los Angeles, uh, Pen America offers a fellowship program called Emerging Voices. And I applied, and out of 150 some applicants, they only picked eight people, and I was one of the eight that was chosen as an Emerging Voices Fellow, and it was there where I met an agent. And she submitted my work to 27 publishers, and then this happened. <laughs> the rejection started coming in. And it was very difficult, you know, when you deal with rejections, just coming in one after the other, after the other, after the other. I had to learn how to hold on fast to my dream. And I had to keep reminding myself that all I needed was just one yes. That's all I needed and that's what I was waiting for. One particular rejection that hurt me deeply was from an agent who said to me, Reina, I like your writing, but I don't think anyone is going to care about a story of a Mexican immigrant girl. So 26 editors said no to my novel. 
and number 27 say yes. <laughs> and writing allowed me to transform myself. I went from being an undocumented immigrant living in the margins of society to a professional writer who knew she had a place in the world. It was my first time getting paid for my writing. And I was no longer an aspiring writer. Now I was an emerging writer. And there's such a beautiful difference between aspiring and emerging. And by using my writing to transform myself, I realized that if I could use it to transform myself, then I could use it to transform the world, to change it, just the way James Baldwin had said. And this was a really crucial step for me because how can we push for social change if we ourselves don't know what change feels like from within our own being, deep inside ourselves? So I wrote another book and another and another. And after four books published, one of my writing mentors said to me, not too long ago, Reina, you can't call yourself an emerging writer anymore. Girl, you have emerged. So now I have transitioned to my next stage, which is where I am right now. And this is the taking flight stage. This is where writing, now I'm writing to change the world. And in the last 12 years since my first novel came out and I became a published writer, I have learned to use writing the way James Baldwin saw it, as a tool to change the way people see the world. As an artist, I've also learned to hear the call to action. When society is in distress, when human rights are at risk, artists do as Toni Morrison once said we do. We speak, we write, we do language, and we help our civilization heal. And I have learned to use the power of language, of stories, to fight for my immigrant community, for people of color, for women, to help my community overcome our collective trauma, because you all know this, that after this administration finally ends, we are going to need some mass scale healing. So, in conclusion, one of the things that I really love about the stage where I'm in right now is knowing that I am part of a community, that I'm not flying alone. And that is something so beautiful that all of us who love books, we are in this fight together. And being a community, being in a community of writers means I get to fight alongside people that I admire, people that I respect and who inspired me, and people who I can call my friends, like Valeria here tonight. So as writers and as readers, as human beings, we have to use language and we have to use literature and stories to advocate, to speak up, to inspire, to create, to fight, to heal, but most of all, to transform ourselves and the world that we live in. Thank you very much. Thank you.